Welcome to the webcast Optimizing Treatment of Complex Bifurcation Lesions. This program is provided by North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, LLC, and is supported by an educational grant from Cordis, a Cardinal Health Company. My name is Dr. Ziad Ali. I am an assistant professor at Columbia University Medical Center with a particular interest in imaging and physiology, as well as the director of the Angiographic Core Lab at Cardiovascular Research Foundation, and I will be your first presenter today. These are my disclosures listed for your reference. My goal in speaking to you today is to outline the current and emerging technologies to treat bifurcation coronary artery disease in contemporary practice. Bifurcation angioplasty accounts for approximately 15 to 20 percent of total PCI. It fits within the realm of complex, high-risk, and indicated PCI, and thus represents a particular challenge. PCIs in these circumstances are challenging because of both technical reasons, but also because of the additional time and contrast required to perform the procedure. There's higher resource utilization and cost, both at the device level as well as at the hospital level, there's lower procedural and angiographic success rates, and there's an inferior long-term clinical outcome compared to PCI overall. Importantly, there's an uncertainty about the best treatment strategy. There's a lack of robust randomized data, and as a result, many of the strategies that are employed and used on a day-to-day -day basis are based on personal experiences rather than robust clinical trial data. And bifurcations in and to themselves do matter. In this individual patient data meta-analysis of all common drug eluting stents, including over 13,000 patients, you can clearly identify that there is a significant increase in target vessel failure in any bifurcation compared to those patients without bifurcations at one year. What is a bifurcation lesion? Well, many of, this, of us are familiar with the Bedina classification of bifurcations. This is largely academic and not particularly helpful in terms of clinical management of patients with bifurcation disease. In actual fact, in clinical practice, bifurcations that require some clinical relevance are really those which involve atherosclerosis of both the main branch and the side branch, as shown here, typically recognized as Medina 011 on the left, 111 in the middle, and 101 on the right. As has been outlined for many years, one of the major debates with bifurcation strategies and treatment is whether to use one stent or two. Through some significant research, including both randomized controlled trials, registries, and personal experience, it is understood that provisional side branch stenting approach is recommended in most cases. And in fact, the minority of bifurcation lesions require a two-stent strategy. This document, produced by the European Bifurcation Club, outlines in your intervention that lesions with difficult wiring or large side branch with extensive disease extending 5 to 10 millimeters beyond the bifurcation may be best approached electively with a two-stent technique. Ultimately, in terms of simple common sense, what matters here is the amount of myocardium that is subtended by the branch vessel. If this branch vessel covers a large amount of myocardium and would be large enough to have stent placement performed safely, then a two stent strategy may be considered in those features outlined in number three. Irrespective of whether you perform a two stent strategy or a provisional techniques, it is important to wire both branches, the main branch and the side branch, through the concept of primum non locare. 
first do no harm. Wiring both branches prevents plaque shift, it provides a marker for side branch and, and makes the angle much more favorable and helps in rewiring the side branch if it is necessary from a provisional peak technique, but also in terms of two stent techniques. At this point, I think it's important to review the available data to understand where we are in contemporary practice with regards to a complex or simple bifurcation strategy. Overall, as could be expected in contemporary PCI, there is no difference in cardiac mortality in patients who undergo either a simple strategy or complex strategy for bifurcation PCI. Target lesion revascularization, although statistically insignificant, does approach a benefit for complex percutaneous coronary intervention of both branches compared to a more simple strategy. Similarly, in terms of instant restenosis, both main vessel restenosis and side branch restenosis seem to favor a complex strategy, although these findings do not reach statistical significance, perhaps due to a paucity of overall patient numbers and clinical trials. The reason for the lack of overall efficacy in terms of target vessel failure is that bifurcation PCI using a simple strategy favors a reduced risk of early myocardial infarction. The decrease in manipulation of the side branch, not having a stent placed, and the lack of high pressure post dilation balloon or ballooning in general in the side branch favors a more likely or greater likelihood of early myocardial infarction in the complex strategy. Overall, myocardial infarction, including both early and late, also is more likely to occur in the complex strategy and does statistically significantly favor the simple strategy. Although not statistically significant due to its low frequency event rate, there does appear to be a trend towards a reduction in stent thrombosis favoring the simple strategy, perhaps simply due to a decrease in the overall amount of metal and turbulence in the bifurcation zone. So while there is little overall clinical benefit seen in randomized controlled trials with final kissing balloons or second stents, most trials were not all Medina true bifurcations as we outlined earlier and did not have complex side branch stenosis or cover significant territory to potentially provide a benefit. This practical approach may be helpful in contemporary practice. After performing accurate assessment of lesion severity, distribution, extension, and the presence of concomitant disease, assessment should be weighed whether or not this is a true bifurcation, meaning significant stenosis in both the main and side branches where there is diameter large enough and ter territory of distribution large enough to favor a two-stent or complex approach. Those features would include the side branch having diffuse disease extending well beyond the ostium for 10 to 20 millimeters or more, as well as the side branch having an unfavorable angle for recrossing after main branch stent implantation if a provisional technique was to be used. In these situations, elective implantation of two stents, including the main branch and the side branch, may be advisable. As mentioned earlier, when we focus on true bifurcations with areas that depend a large amount of myocardium and where the artery is large enough to favor the implantation of a stent where an acceptable stent expansion may be achieved, there does appear to be a benefit in terms of target vessel revascularization favoring a more complex strategy. Again, although this is of borderline significance, perhaps to a paucity of data in randomized controlled trials, you will note that there is a strong trend towards favoring the complex strategy when the side branch is greater than 2.5 millimeters. Similarly, 
even main vessel restenosis has a strong trend towards reduced restenosis when the side branch is greater than 2.5 millimeters, perhaps due to the complex of side branch and main vessel PCI allowing for, for more expansion in both vessels following kissing balloon inflation. When we look at true bifurcations as outlined and defined above, you'll note that both main vessel and side branch target vessel revascularization and restenosis favor a trend towards a complex strategy. So when it is determined that two stents are needed, which technique? Such a strategy can be confusing. Terms such as mini crush, culotte, DK crush, culotte, V stenting, pot, SKS, T in protrusion, bailout, provide a confusing platform for the operator to determine exactly which procedure to perform. As mentioned above, these techniques may be complex in terms of both technical procedure as well as require greater radiation and contrast utilization. As an outline, two-stent bifurcation stent techniques include T-stenting, crush stenting, culotte stenting, as well as SKSV stenting. It should be noted that T and protrusion technique is the preferred for a bailout strategy following provisional stenting, and the preferred two-stent strategies currently would be DK crush due to a decreased likelihood of stent deformation over the side branch, as well as larger orifice area in the side branch when DK crush is preferred, or culotte when there is not a significant difference in the two vessels in terms of vessel sizing. Before employing a two-stent strategy, it's important to determine and recognize what the risk factors for target vessel failure in a two-strength strategy would be. Here in this study from Korea of 951 patients, you'll note that a treated bifurcation in the left main with osteoristenosis of the circumflex being the likely culprit, a high syntax score greater than 32 indicating severe atherosclerotic diffuse coronary disease, and diabetes are all risk factors for target vessel failure using a two-stent strategy. However, second-generation drug eluding stents, non-compliant balloon use, and final kissing balloon inflation all reduce the risk of target vessel failure in two-stent strategies and hence should be considered the standard of therapy in each uh, case of two-stent strategies. In order to simplify some of the steps earlier described and some of the confusion in terms of the platforms for different techniques for bifurcation stenting, a number of companies have focused on trying to develop specific technology for main branch stenting with some degree of side branch scaffolding. Here on the upper panel, labeled number one, you'll see that there are a number of different devices which are focused towards being able to treat the side branch using the provisional technique. Number two shows dedicated side branch te techniques of which Triton is the only one approved by the FPA in the United States, and we will focus on Triton shortly. Other dedicated bifurcation techniques include the bifurcated tech from Medtronic, as well as the proximal access device neither of which are available or readily used. The Triton side branch stent deserves particular focus as it has recently been FDA approved and is now in use in clinical practice and thus may be a tool for interventional cardiologists who want to perform two vessel stenting with ease and with a predictable, reliable result. The Triton side branch stent ultimately uses a culotte stenting technique that is simplified. The stent itself is focused on having a side branch zone of approximately 6.5 millimeters, which focuses on the ostium of the side branch where restenosis is the most likely to occur. A transition zone, which allows passage of a main vessel drug eluding stent 
thus allowing completion of a bifurcation stent with ease and a main bright zone which acts as a relatively metal-free scaffold by which the side branch stent can be anchored. Triton is a cobalt alloy bare metal stent. The technique used to deploy the Triton is that of very similar to that performed for a culotte. The Triton is positioned and deployed after pre-dilation and vessel preparation, securing and protecting the side branch. Thereafter, the main vessel is treated with an approved drug eluting stent through the main portion of the Triton. Finally, a kissing balloon post dilation to ensure complete lesion and osteum coverage is performed, completing the bifurcation stenting. The original Triton Pivotal Randomized Control Trial randomized patients to a provisional technique against a Triton bifurcation dedicated stent looking for a primary non-inferiority endpoint to target vessel failure. In this original study, target vessel failure did not meet the primary endpoint. While there is no difference in cardiac deaths, and no difference in clinically driven target vessel revascularization, this difference in target vessel failure was largely driven by an increase in target vessel myocardial infarction. The target vessel MI driven by per was largely driven by per periprocedural myocardial infarction, where the protocol myocardial infarction definition was Q wave or non Q wave MI where the biomarkers were three times the upper limit of normal of CKMB. This technique or this definition of periprocedural MI has largely been abandoned due to its lack of clinical relevance. In more contemporary practice, the SKY definition of periprocedural myocardial infarction is now used with a five times the upper limit of normal CKMB when there's presence of Q waves or new left bundle branch block, or in fact, a 10 times upper limit of normal CKMB when there is no new left bundle branch block or Q waves. When using troponin I or T, there's a 35 times upper limit of normal increase with Q waves or new left bundle branch block, and in the absence of these, 70 times the upper limit of normal of the troponin I or T is required to meet the definition of paraprocedural MI. The reason for this new definition of MI was that it was determined that the previous version, similar to the protocol MI, did not bear to have clinical significance and as a result may not be useful as either a definition in clinical trials nor in contemporary clinical practice. The important thing also to note in the Triton pivotal study was that despite being an inclusion criteria whereby the side branch had to be greater than 2.5 millimeters in diameter and geographically equivalent to QCA of 2.25 millimeters, a large number of patients actually had stents that were less than 2.25 millimeters placed. And as you can see, when we compare target vessel failure, target vessel myocardial infarction, and clinically driven target vessel revascularization, there's a significant increase in terms of target vessel failure in those in this Triton side branch group where the vessel is small. Hence, this goes against the principle which we talked about earlier, whereby in order for bifurcation stenting with two stents, to have a benefit, there must be a large enough myocardial territory to be subtended to actually incur a benefit. The Triton confirmatory study was a study which tracked upon the pivotal study whereby a predefined benchmark was used to determine whether the Triton was safe or not in terms of risk of paraprocedural myocardial infarction. In this study, the major difference was that these 133 patients, it was ensured that all of the side branches 
were at least 2.5 millimeters or larger by visual estimation. The endpoints were clinical follow-up 30 days in one year. And when using the protocol definition of MI and ensuring that vessels were 2.5 millimeters or larger, the performance goal of 17.9% was met easily with no significant difference between provisional and Triton. We recently undertook a new analysis whereby we pooled all of the data available for the Triton dedicated bifurcation system. Here, we used the pooled data, we used the Triton confirmatory data, as well as the Triton rolling arm, equaling total of 837 patients. We focused on patients who had a side branch greater than 2.25 by QCA, equivalent to a visual estimation of 2.5, and had true bifurcations with clinical follow-up at one year. Our primary endpoint was to target vessel failure, which included cardiac death, and target vessel MI according to a more contemporary definition, as defined by SKY, and ischemia-driven target vessel revascularization. Importantly, when using a more practical and contemporary definition, in this post hoc analysis, we found that the primary endpoint by intention to treat of target vessel failure at one year was not different between Triton and Provisional, hence meeting the primary endpoint of the study with Triton being non-inferior to Provisional stenting. Importantly, when we looked at each of the components of target vessel failure, including cardiac death, target vessel MI, and ischemia-driven target vessel revascularization, there was no significant difference, nor was there any difference in target lesion failure or major adverse cardiovascular events. However, when we focused specifically on procedural outcomes, we saw clearly that Triton had a benefit over provisional stenting. The side branch minimal lumen diameter, diameter stenosis, and side branch acute gain all favor the Triton. Clinical device, lesion, and procedural success all favor the Triton dedicated bifurcation stent. At nine months, post-procedure quantitative coronary angiography also showed a benefit in the side branch in terms of the minimal lumen diameter, as well as a reduction in side branch diameter stenosis compared to provisional. Most importantly, binary restenosis at nine months follow-up was significantly lower in the side branch in Triton-treated patients compared to provisional. It's important to note that the Triton pool data is still of insignificant power to determine whether or not there can be a decrease in target lesion failure specifically in the side branch, and a larger trial would be needed in order to power such a study. So in conclusion, provisional main branch stenting remains the default for bifurcation PCI. The preferred technique, T in protrusion, is for bailout, and DK crush or culotte is for two stent strategies. However, when a dedicated bifurcation stent, such as the Triton dedicated bifurcation stent system is used, it may provide a simpler and more predictable result. Our data show that there's a non-inferior result of Triton compared to provisional, and that the simple steps may improve both usability and overall adoption of bifurcation techniques in situations where there's a large amount of myocardium subtended by the side branch and there's a large potential for benefit by the patient. I'd like to thank you for your time and we'll now move on to the second presenter. All right, well, it's a pleasure to share with you a talk on the Triton bifurcation stent uh, and share some practical pointers for technical success uh, with this device. Here are my disclosures, uh, none of which will affect uh, the content of this talk. Well, I was asked in a prior talk to address a question, can Triton give drug-eluting-like results in bifurcations? First, what are drug-eluting results for bifurcations? 
without Triton, the 2017 PCI strategy in general is a one drug eluding primary strategy. Our goals in PCI bifurcation uh, are to, and, and considerations would include we want to optimize result in the main vessel primarily while still preserving good flow in the side branch. We want to minimize revascularization uh, and probably more importantly acute closures of either branch. Um, we, we need to remember that the side branch itself is often only a discrete osteal lesion and we want to make future interventions hopefully not necessary at all but if they are necessary easier to perform. Now we've seen various techniques for stenting bifurcation lesions many of which are illustrated here and you can see that there are issues with all of those uh, in that there's either metal on metal um, or you leave a little gap uh, in the ostium where the disease in the in the side branch and none of these are ideal or physiologic. And there are again multiple issues with these two drug eluding stent bifurcation strategies and they make future revascularizations more difficult and potentially lead to more episodes of closure of the side branch with the metal on metal. Now we think the Triton should be better than a two DES strategy. Why? It has a short six millimeter stent uh, designed for the osteal side branch. It maximizes the drug eluding stent in the main branch while still preserving access to the side branch. That six millimeter side branch stent is not crushed or distorted in any way and yet completely covers the ostium of the side branch. Um, the configuration of it minimizes metal on metal interactions um, and uh, still preserves a physiologic bifurcation. Importantly, the Triton device is implanted only after we have achieved optimal and documented op uh, preparation of both vessels uh, and the Triton device can also be used in combination with either uh, drug coated balloons if they're available at your place or with additional drug eluding stents in the side branch if, if you have long disease in the side branch. What I'd like to do is show two trial cases uh, that we did uh, during the pivotal trial uh, that have some nice teaching points through there as we run through uh, the Triton device and try to answer the question of, of whether it can give drug eluding stent-like results in bifurcations. Uh, I will say anecdotally, uh, for the pivotal trial, uh, there were 12-month angiograms which were mandated, and I will say that we saw a lot of drug-eluting stent-like results even at 12 months. So here's case one. Uh, you can see that there's a uh, LAD diagonal bifurcation here seen in the AP cranial view, and here an LAO cranial view. Again, an important diagonal, high-grade lesion in both the uh, LAD and in the diagonal. Uh, all right, now here, seen in the arrows, first we've wired both vessels, and here's a balloon uh, in the LAD position to pretreat the LAD first. Here's inflation of the balloon. Again, very important that we want to adequately prep both vessels before implanting the Triton device. After this, here's the balloon in the diagonal vessel. Uh, and again, we're doing two things. We're checking on the results of the preparation of the LED and measuring in the diagonal before we inflate. And here's angioplasty in the diagonal vessel. And again, you can see the improved bifurcation preparation after angioplasty of both vessels. Both vessels are wired. Here is uh, positioning the Triton device in the diagonal or the side branch. And what you want to do is take the two mid markers and straddle them 50-50 on the carina itself. Uh, here you can see it in the LAO cranial view. And here uh, you can see it in two views. I think it's important to position it in two views and ensure your, to yourself uh, that you have uh, the carina straddled with the two mid markers as you see here. Okay. Here is uh, inflating uh, the Triton device. And here's a result after the Triton, and you can see the nice result in the diagonal. Okay. 
All right. Now, the next important step is to do the so-called POTS uh, angioplasty, where you take non-compliant balloon angioplasty across the wedding band into the ostium of the uh, side branch triton stent. So here is a 3.25 millimeter non-compliant balloon, a short balloon uh, used for the uh, balloon uh, of the wedding band and the tip of the uh, diagonal ostium. And here's that non-compliant balloon angioplasty. Here you see a nice result in the diagonal vessel and in the main branch, and now we're ready to do our drug gluing stent uh, in the main vessel. Now, the next step is to take your uh, side branch wire and redirect it into the uh, parent vessel, or in this case, the LED. Here you can see it being re-advanced here. Now, important pointer. Your balloon should go easily over that redirected wire. Here, notice it is not. It's kicking the guide back, so there's a problem uh, there, and that, prob that wire is probably trapped or behind the wedding band, and we'll show that. Watch again as we redirected. This wire was bent, and we actually got behind the wedding band before advancing it, and you can see that if you watch it again slowly. And again, here's just two pictures within the circle where you can actually see it going behind the wedding band. That's not where you want it. So when you encounter resistance with a balloon, uh, that gives you a clue that that has probably happened. So what do you do? Uh, you take a new wire from the LED and just rewire that carefully, and then slide your balloon down just to make sure it passes easily. Uh, and then we did balloon angioplasty in the LED. Here's the result after that angioplasty is looking good. Now we're ready for the drug gluing stent in the LAD. And here's positioning the LAD across the side branch and across the wedding band uh, and deploying that. And here you can see the very nice result in the LAD and the diagonal. Okay. Now remember, you're not done. You absolutely must finish with a kissing balloon angioplasty like all bifurcation stenting. And here, one of the nice things about the Triton device is usually very easy to rewire that side branch stent of the Triton as shown here. And then here's a final non-compliant kissing balloon angioplasty, positioning the balloons and inflating them. And again, here's the final results. And I think when asked, that is a pretty drug eluding stent-like result uh, acutely, uh, and it looks very good in the AP cranial, and with the wires out uh, also in the LAO cranial, again, looks very good. And look at the nice architecture of the Triton uh, stent platform. All right, our second case, a little bit more challenging bifurcation with some other pointers as well. Here you can see the typical LED diagonal bifurcation, a little bit more disease in the diagonal, a little bit more angulation. Now. Learning a lesson that we learned from the first case, notice how that first wire was pretty uh, prolapsed. And so rather than trying to redirect a badly prolapsed wire, we use that as a buddy wire, put a second wire into the diagonal, and now we have a wire in the LED and a diagonal, and it's a good wire in the diagonal. Okay. And here, again, with two wires, we're going to prep the LED. There's our balloon for preparation and positioning. Here is an angioplasty in the LED. And again, now we're going to uh, do our preparatory uh, angioplasty in the diagonal and at the same time assess our LED preparation shown here. And there's our balloon angioplasty of the diagonal. Here's our result after our preparation. And you make a decision whether you need to put a longer stent or not in the diagonal after you put your Triton device in. Here's positioning the Triton device in the diagonal. Again, remember, we're going to straddle uh, the, uh, the carina of the bifurcation with 50% uh, of the mid, two mid markers. And here's the second view. And now once you're comfortable, you position the, and deploy the Triton device, as shown here. Here's the result after the Triton. And this was in the pivotal trial. We thought that the result after that uh, osteo-diagonal looked good. We did not need to put another stent. In real life, in outside of a trial, if you thought that was disease, you could add a second uh, drug wing stent, uh, or you could add a drug wing stent in the diagonal now.
Now, remember the next step is the short non-compliant angioplasty across the wedding band into the ostium of the triton diagonal stent, shown here with a short non-compliant balloon. Here is the result after that non-compliant post dilatation. Now, the good wire, remember not the prolapse one, now we're going to take a good wire from the diagonal and redirect it into the uh, LAD as shown here. And now once you've done that, uh, it's, I think, a good idea to take the trapped wire out, the original wire that's now behind the wedding band. Just go ahead and take that out so there's no confusion. And here's positioning our, our LAD drug gluing stand across the diagonal and then deploying it. And there's the result after the drug gluing stand in the LAD, looking very good. Okay. Again, remember you must rewire it, and with the Triton device, that's usually very easy, as uh, shown here. And then uh, here's our final kissing balloon uh, angioplasty in the LAD and diagonal. And again, ask, is this a drug wound stent uh, result? I think that the answer is yes, and the uh, lesion that was treated. And again, same question in the second LAO cranial view. And now you see uh, not only the nice result in the vessel, but also I want to show you the architecture of that device uh, and look how nicely uh, that uh, is spread out across the bifurcation without a metal-on-metal -metal interaction. And again, that uh, comes out very nicely here uh, in both the angiogram uh, and the uh, cine of the stent itself without contrast. And again, here, I think you uh, it would answer that yes, that does look drug eluting stent like result. So, in conclusion, uh, I think that the Triton system offers a dedicated bifurcation device utilizing a short side branch which is incorporated into a platform which allows uh, branch preservation in combination with optimizing main branch or main vessel drug eluting stent treatment. Triton may offer drug looting stent-like results without some of the challenges of the traditional one and two drug looting stent strategies for bifurcation PCI. And I'd like to thank you very much uh, for your attention, and we'll be uh, happy to answer any questions that there may be. Again, thank you very much. So, Chris, what are the key anatomical and lesion characteristics that might indicate the need for a two-stent strategy? So. You started your case, you see a bifurcation lesion. What are you worried about? So a couple of things. Yeah, good, great question. I think it's very, very relevant to this. You know, just briefly, as you know, in general, we don't like two-stent traditional strategies. You know, I mean, metal on metal, whether it's mini crush, culotte, or whatever, has all kind of issues. Either you miss the ostium of the side branch, or you put metal on metal and have to do things that are kind of non-physiologic, and they can lead to... Uh, problems later, especially in the side branch, and they're harder to fix. So going into that, we've been, most of us do a uh, provisional one stent strategy and, you know, try not to stent the diagonal. Now, that's pre-Triton. If you have a dedicated platform that makes it easier and more physiologic, then I think you have a more consideration for using that strategy. So what tells me to do that? I think if the side branch itself is an important vessel, at least 2.5 millimeters, and it has significant stenosis in it, you know, at least 60 or 70, and especially if that disease is contiguous with the disease in the main branch, then that's when I'm going to really start thinking about um, really preserving flow to that and considering the Triton device. If there's any question, what you can do is wire both of them uh, and pre-treat and then see what it looks like uh, and then use that as your determinant. I think if there's no disease in the diagonal, I don't think, personally, I'd be interested in your opinion, I don't think that you need to put a Triton device in just because you're stenting across, for example, a diagonal or a marginal or something like that. But again, I, for me, if it's a decent-sized vessel uh, in, a, supplying a significant territory uh, and it is uh, tight, then I think that's when we're we're going to think about this strategy. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I, Chris, I, I think that approach is supported by the data. So if you look at the angiographic predictors, 
of a positive FFR in the side branch, one that comes up is a 54% uh, diameter stenosis in the side branch by QCA. So that's somewhere around 70%. That's where this kind of 50% number came up. And I think right. your comment about the amount of myocardium that's supplied by that branch is, is critical. So um, as we presented earlier, some of the new Triton analysis data showed that when you focus on true bifurcations and focus on um, vessels that are greater than 2.5 and actually cover some amount of myocardium, then the, the benefit is clear. You end up with a much better angiographic result and all of the procedural outcomes are better with the Triton device. So I completely, I, I think you got to use some clinical common sense here and say yeah. we shouldn't be sticking, uh, you know, bifurcation stents into twigs. But if you've got right. a lot of territory that can make the patient ischemic, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, there's some work by the Korean group that shows that once it gets to about 11%, that's considered to be moderate ischemia. And that uh, on a stress test, for example, somewhere that we would, uh, you know, start considering putting in a side brain stand. All right. I think those are good points. I, what do you think FFR, if it's visual, so let's say you weren't going to use a Triton stent, at, at least up front, but then you pinched the um, side branch off. Is that a time when you'd use FFR? Um, and if there was disease in there, 70% or more in a decent-sized vessel, do you think FFR is needed? It, it's helped us before tell us that we probably didn't need to fix as many side branches as we used to fix. What do you think about that? Chris, I think that's a fantastic question, and I do think that it is, uh, it's a very reasonable approach. So you've, let's say, for instance, you've decided not to – uh, do a two stent strategy and you perform provisional stenting and now you've got a bad pinch. You know, the FFR could save you a lot of hassle. Um, if you put the FFR down and it's normal, you're done. And if it's abnormal, um, the data from Korea, uh, which is a very large registry study, shows that if you balloon dilate that side branch with a balloon that's uh, undersized, 0 0.7 to 1, that you will correct the FFR to a non-ischemic value in 92% of occasions, and more so that at six months, that number doesn't really change. Uh, so I think that takes into account all the plaque shift as well as the actual um, carina shift. So I think it's a reasonable approach. Um, you know, the alternative would be, you know, from a practical approach, Chris, I think I would I would do that before I put in a second stent. Yeah. I think I have a low threshold if I've got a very, you know, bad 90% pinch for me to go in and do a little balloon massage based on this coup data from, from uh, Korea. Um, but I think before I'm going to put a second stent in, I'd probably do an FFR. Uh, what do you think about kissing balloon, Ziad? Is it, if we do the Triton stent, or any two-stand strategy, uh, what do you think the, the need for kissing final kissing balloon is? So I think if you've decided to go with a two-stand strategy, then kissing balloon inflation has to be the default. Um, there is very good bench evidence as well as some reasonable evidence in vessels that are 2.5 or greater that the final kissing balloon improves outcomes. And from a mechanistic point of view, Ultimately, what you're trying to do here is move the struts out of the way of the ostium of the side branch. And I think that's the, the critical piece. Um, so I would think that the default is a kissing balloon inflation. You know, I want to kick that back to you, Chris, and say, what do you think the role of kissing balloon inflation is if you have done a provisional technique? Yeah, so, I, oh boy, that's a great question. So first of all, we, we both will agree completely if you use a Triton device or if you use a two-stand strategy, which is less physiologic perhaps than Triton, I think it's mandatory. You must recross and you must do a final kissing balloon. You know, I, I don't care how good it looks, you must do a final kissing balloon if you have two stents. I think less so, you know, in my younger days before I had gray in the hair, um, I would often do a kissing balloon if I didn't, you know, just to make it cosmetically good, uh, if I didn't put a stent in the side branch. I've changed a lot over the years, uh, and I think that as long as it's 
non-flow limbing, doesn't have a dissection, it's 50% or less, I don't think you do a kissing balloon for cosmetics. Um, and that's where your FFR may be very helpful because the FFR is normal. You know, the truth is when we do the repeat angiograms and somebody has a pinch just from putting a stent across it, but it wasn't flow limiting and it wasn't severe, most of those look better. Uh, and I think we may do more harm than good by doing a kissing balloon and if it's not flow limiting, not severe, or there's not a positive FFR just because we pinched it with a stent. That would be and, my approach. And I think, you know, I couldn't agree more, Chris. And I think that, you know, the use of physiology, especially in, now that we've got these hyperemic free indices, IFR, there will be some new ones coming up shortly, this really is pretty much, you know, as quick as getting the wire down. And, of course, there's been problems in the past with uh, wiring, with an FFR wire through a side branch, but some of the newer technologies with the optical sensors are getting closer and closer to being um, uh, similar to uh, workhorse wires. So I think this area is really going to, to grow. Um, but, but I, you know, I really agree with you. I had a case I, you, I'd like to ask your opinion on. It. You know, I stented the left main and ended up uh, stenting across. The cirque didn't have any disease. Ended up with like a 40, 50% circumflex lesion. And so I decided, you know, what do you do there? Do you mess with the ostium of the circumflex? We know that the restenosis almost always comes from the ostium of the circumflex in this situation. Or, or, or do you leave it? I, I personally would not mess with it. It was forty percent because you, you know, you, you, for me, the left main to LID, you can pretty much hammer the the left main post dilatation, not hurting the LID. And if it's forty percent in the circ and there's normal flow, especially if it's a non dominant circ, I think you're asking, uh, um, you know, for for trouble. Uh, by doing that, and then if you get a dissection of the circ, now you're really now you're adding oh, yeah. a stent there that that has problems. So, if if there is a final kissing balloon, should it be non-compliant or semi-compliant? What do you think? So I'm going to say non-compliant. Um, you know, the goal of the final kissing balloon is to recreate the architecture of the carina using the stents, and Semi-compliant balloons are basically going to favor the side of the lower pressure or the larger vessel. So that's the whole point of a semi-compliant balloon. It's kind of like a party balloon. If you push it to one direction, it'll go that direction. So if you've got a bigger space in the main branch than the side branch and you use two semi-compliant balloons, it's going to favor the main branch. So you're not going to reconstruct that carina and manage the metal the way you want it to. So my uh, standard on this is to use a non-compliant balloon. You know, Chris, practically speaking, we've both been there. There's some situations where it's, it might just not be worth it to push the second NC balloon down, right? right. You, you know you're going to damage the struts. You've struggled. You can't get things through. In that situation, I might dilate the side branch with, with a semi-compliant, and then I'll go back with a non-compliant. How do you approach the, those situations? So I think I think they're good good points. The the challenge every now and then comes from getting a non-compliant balloon through the struts into the side branch, and if that's the case, I do exactly what you would do is have a, make sure I've got a supportive wire um, and uh, into the side branch, and then balloon it with a smaller semi-compliant balloon, which is easier across, and then you can get. Uh, the, the the balloons, uh, you know, both non-compliant balloons in. Uh, but I, I, I really would prefer non-compliance. You just have to work a little bit harder to get there. Several physicians have asked about using Triton in a reverse fashion in order to place DES in the greater disease vessel. Is there any problems with this uh, for the Triton design? For instance, in the situation the main branch and the side branch are almost straight, does this cause a problem with the alignment of the markers for placement of the metal to vessel ratio. Um, good question. So uh, from what my understanding is, is if you have a very large and diseased diagonal branch, um, could you actually put your triton in towards the LAD and then use your DES in the side branch? Um, so first, I'm going to answer that in two parts. First of all, I don't do that. Um, 
what I would do, a lot of people are actually, and I have done this myself, is that now that the, although this is off-label, um, now that the Triton is approved, there's nothing stopping you from putting a DES up to the Carina in the side branch. So you could consider the Triton so um, to be sort of a Carina reconstruction device. Uh, there, probably in my last six or seven cases, I placed the Triton and then I put drug eluting stents down the diagonal further down to cover the disease. There is one really important point with regards to the bare metal aspect of this stent. The mechanism of restenosis at the ostium of the side branch is often not neointimal hyperplasia. The reason I can hopefully prove that to you is that you will note that once you to perform your bifurcation stenting, often despite all the non-compliant balloons and one-to-one -one sizing, the side branch still doesn't have 100% free of disease. It still looks a little pinched at the side branch. The reason that is that the side branch is the most muscular part of the artery, right? So the, it's the amount of muscle that actually causes the recoil in these kind of thinner stent struts. So as a result, the bare metal may not have the impact that it would do in a main vessel in terms of the need for the drug. Chris, I've never used that technique to, quote, on, you know, for lack of a better word, put the Triton in backwards. Um, any experience? So I, I, we have a couple times. But I, and I think it's all a matter of uh, art and tailoring it to what you got there. You got to remember a couple things. You really want to not put a vessel in jeopardy that you're going to have trouble rewiring. Uh, so if there's a really bad angle in one direction, you're going to figure that into which one has a Triton side branch uh, that you have to then redirect that wire into the other one. If it's a bad angle, you might con uh, consider, you know, re quote reversing it, provided the sizing uh, of that. You wouldn't want to put a bare metal side branch into a main vessel where it was tr significantly undersized, especially if you weren't going to add drug to it. That would actually defeat the purpose, I think. So those are some things uh, that, that, that I think uh, are important there. Towards your, and there's another question that's up there, and you've already addressed it somewhat. Some, some are concerned whether the bare metal part of this uh, is, is a bad thing, um, maybe worse than two drug eluting stents. I like exactly what you said. If there's long disease in the diagonal or whatever, you know, the side branch, there's nothing wrong with adding a drug eluting stent to treat the longer disease, and you've created a physiologic platform for that. You just want to make sure you don't bring that stent back into the main vessel, making your life uh, more difficult. If it's not long disease, Heck, as you said, that little tiny osteal disease with a six millimeter bare metal stent that's physiologic, you're going to be fine. You don't need drug for a two or three or four millimeter uh, length, I don't think. Um, so I, I, I would th completely th agree with you. So there's not a lot of data out there to suggest that, um, that uh, the drug elution has a benefit on the side branch restenosis. Um, so until that data is available, I think it is reasonable to assess that the mechanisms of restenosis may be as well served with a bare metal as a drug eluding. Uh, there just isn't enough data. Um, when you perform your final inflation, do you do the final kissing balloon side branch first? What should be the last thing you do? I like the last thing we do is I want them both up at the same time. Um, you know whether you do that, whether you have to facilitate that by first opening the side branch a little more and then doing it. That's pretty rare. That's we already talked about that just to get the non-compliant balloon in. But for the final non-compliant, both at the same time. Agree completely. Remember, the whole point of the kissing balloon inflation at the end is to reconstruct the carina. If you inflate the side branch first, you will pull the metal off of the main vessel. That's why that's the point of the kissing balloon in the first place. Right. And I, I would like to see if you agree with this, Ziad, but really I, I think that the idea here is that the Triton system offers us uh, kind of a dedicated bifurcation device that uses that short side branch stent which is incorporated into a platform, and that platform is designed to allow branch preservation, combining that with optimal main branch drug eluting stenting. Uh, and then I think that that design may offer drug eluting stent-like results 
uh, without some of the challenges that we had of the traditional one or two drug looting stent strategies. Do you think, uh, uh, do, would you agree with that? I agree. And may, basically, this is a simple, straightforward, predictable way to perform bifurcation stenting. I, I agree entirely. Maybe that is, is even the way to, to kind of wrap things up. What do you think? Absolutely. Chris, thanks so much for joining me this afternoon. I'd like to thank all of the audience uh, for listening to today's webinar. To be eligible for continuing education credit for today's activity, please log on to www.naccme.com, successfully complete your 10-question post-test and evaluation form, and print your documentation and credit. This concludes today's session. Thank you all for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.